Hello, and welcome to the first in a series of videos um, kind of going in depth into the music of my favorite band of all time. And, you know, I'm a slobbering fanboy, so they're the greatest band of all time as far as I'm concerned. Um, let me just play you a couple of licks and, um, and help you sort of to, to sort of understand who I'm talking about. Uh, my name is Mark. Um, my wife calls me douchebag. My daughter calls me dad. My good close friends call me Deke. But you folks out there, you can just call me Mark. Because I can't pretend a stranger is a long-awaited friend. And that is a beautiful, I think, segue into the very first lick. <laughs> You know who I'm talking about, right? You know that instantly. I don't really even have to go any further. It's Rush. These videos are going to be sort of an in-depth analysis, not just based on a fan's perspective of the music, and I am. I'm a huge Rush fan. I like it all, including that weird middle period where all they used was synthesizers for almost everything. Um, this is going to be an examination of why the music has been so, I guess... Um, phenomenal over the years. It's had such an impact on not just musicians, and it has an enormous impact on musicians like myself, professional guys, the guys from Dream Theater, the guys from Metallica, um, Billy Corgan. Uh, all these people are hugely influenced, if not by the music of Rush, the concept of Rush. Rush has always been a band that did what it wanted to do, and did so with spectacular success. Maybe not so much at first, but with spectacular success. Um, what I want to do, what I, what I really want to do in these videos is to show a little closer what makes the music so cool and, and so good. And a lot of that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna look, we're gonna talk about the guitar stuff that Alex does. We're gonna talk about the bass stuff that Getty, that, that Getty does, and we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about the drum stuff that Neil does. Now, I started as a drummer about a hundred years ago, and I was already a Rush fan by the time that happened. Um, so, I, I, looking at it from a standpoint of a drummer, greatest band I'd ever heard of, right? Greatest band I'd ever seen. About 17, I picked up a guitar and spent years learning. And the first three bands that influenced the way I play today and why I play today were Rush, Led Zeppelin, and Pink Floyd. Those three bands, probably Rush more than the other two, are the reason that I play guitar today. I probably might have stayed a drummer, and I'm, I'm not half bad. I, I did, I think my last live gig as a drummer, I was in Germany in the Army. It was 1987, I think, a long time ago. Had a double bass Rogers kit that, you know, a double bass 11 piece Rogers kit that literally took a moving van to get from the house to practice and then from the house to a gig. Switched over to guitar and realized, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. I'm tired of lugging all that shit around. I'm done. Plus, the guitar just sort of started feeling natural to me, more natural than drums did. Drums always seem to take a, a lot of work to maintain a specific level. I was already fairly good at a, at a specific level, but it took a lot of work to maintain that level and then grow beyond it. Guitar was different. As I was learning guitar, I was learning something, it seemed like, learning something new every day. A new technique, a new scale, a new song, a new idea, a new concept. I was learning constantly, constantly. And I began to feel more, more fulfilled playing guitar. And as a consequence of switching over to guitar from drums, I began to look at Rush differently. I began to see the band differently. I began to listen to those guitar parts. Nope. Sorry about that. <laughs> That 
that's from the first album. That's called What You're Doing. Great song. Love it. Love, 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 love it. Um, those riffs were very eerily reminiscent of Led Zeppelin. Rush was, at first, kind of a, a Zeppelin clone band. Their first album. Their first album was sort of a Zeppelin clone album. They, Getty had that high voice, like Robert Plant did. Um, John Rutsey, while not the greatest drummer in the world, had some good, solid, uh, we'll say Bonham-esque um, licks. Uh, and um, Alex was... Alex was a Jimmy Page fan, and you could hear it in his in his playing. You could hear it in his writing. You could hear those those aspects um, of their influences early on, on the first album. As you all know, things changed dramatically when Neil joined the band after um, the the original Rush album. The first Rush album was released. John Rutsey was John Rutsey was sent his merry way. He was um, he had diabetes and was not a healthy guy, so they knew that he wasn't going to survive touring, and they wanted to tour. So they auditioned for drummers, and lo and behold, here comes this big gangly kid named Neil and uh, from St. Catharines, Canada, and he became, well, the rest is history, right? Um, we're going to be, I want to talk about the guitar on the first album. Uh, the music on the first album, like I said, it's, it's very Zeppelin-esque. It's kind of stripped down, and it's kind of simple. Um, Getty's, at the time, Getty is learning to really get the most out of his voice. Yes, he screeches a lot. Sorry, not sorry. I love that stuff. That first album is really outstanding. The guitar stuff was pretty simple as far as the rhythms went. Alex was just beginning to figure out who he was as a soloist. So yeah, he knew the basic pentatonic minor scale. <laughs> He knew that intimately, but he had a tendency to add little flourishes to the scales and play them in in positions that other guys didn't seem to use. So he, he sort of always had a kind of a unique solo um, approach, uh, and it just got better as the years progressed. Um, you know, this is not a tough lick to play. <laughs> is very different from, say, this. absolute favorite track I gotta be honest with you I don't really like it I always I always had problems with the production on that album I thought John Ritz, John Rutsey's snare sounded terrible just awful I hated the sound of his snare drum hated it his bass drum had a very dry oh it was so dry and his his toms didn't you know the production on the drums was not great um, the production on the guitar and the vocals and the bass really good there are some really great moments on the B-sides on that album, I call them the B-sides, the songs that never hit the radio. Um, what You're Doing did, um, obviously Working Man did, In the Mood. Wait a minute. That, you know, straight ahead, sort of uh, bluesy-esque kind of guitar riff. But there are some other really, truly spectacular moments on that album. One of them is called um, Here, uh, Here Again. My favorite song on the album is Here Again. If you get a chance to listen to it, um, it's very different than the rest of the album. It's almost, Getty's voice is the same. Getty's voice is sort of the, it's the underpinning that, 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 cement, that, that sort of ties the whole album together. But there are a lot of different musical ideas and concepts going on in that album. 
Um, there's some, you know, the basic, the basic blues rock type stuff. And then there's, you know, the, 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 the kind of hard rock uh, feel of working man. And then there are a couple other moments. Um, here again is one of them, one of the other favorites, and everybody knows this. <laughs> Right. Awesome. That's Jimmy Page. That's Alex just ripping Jimmy Page off. That's all it is. But it's beautiful. It's, it's good the way he does it. Here again, though, here again is sort of a, it's a slower kind of uh, more mellow feel with a really cool guitar part. And one of the best solos that I think Alex did on, I got to say, on the first maybe three albums, the best guitar solo he did on the first three albums was on the song Here Again. Just so beautiful. We're going to talk about Alex's equipment. We're going to talk about Getty's equipment. We're going to talk about effects the band was sort of into. We're even going to talk about that weird middle period with all the synths. You see the keyboards behind me. They're there for a reason. We're going to talk about it all. I'm going to go over as much of it as I possibly can. Can't play the bass like Getty does. I have one, and we're going to take a look at some of the, some of the um, ideas, the concepts that he uses how his bass playing evolved over the years. There was no rhythm guitar player, so Getty had to play bass and rhythm guitar at the same time. That's how his style evolved. That's why he plays the way he does. Um, the song Here Again on the first album, um, it, it's a B minor, kind of slow B minor. It's almost a ballad, but Getty's voice is not ballady, ballad-esque, whatever you want to call it. It's not. He's, at times... He's got some good control in there, and, 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 and he hits some really just some sweet, beautiful notes, but he doesn't have the pretty voice that you need, say, at the time 1974 this was, 1974, I think, no, uh, yeah, 1974, 1974, the first Rush album came out. Um, it doesn't have, he, they don't, they're trying to be a, Lep, a Zeppelin clone band, but they're not, they're still themselves. You can still hear their individual personalities. You know what I mean? Musical personalities. You can still hear them. Here again, Getty hits some... I mean, it's an awesome song. The lyrics are beautiful. The melody that he chooses for it... pause for just a moment and get some legal stuff out of the way. These videos are intended for critique, for instruction, and for edification only. I own no rights to any of this material. None. No copyright infringement is intended in accordance with whatever statute is the flavor of the month. This is, th these, these videos are under the, the fair use clause. Uh, I, I would hate to be accused of copyright infringement. That is not my intent. I'm, I'm, I'm simply trying to give a critical analysis, a good look at why their music was so influential to so many musicians today. And the best way to do that is to show you firsthand why they're so unique as a band. Here's a, here's a riff from the second album. Um, uh, and it's it's in uh, it's very it's instructive to show you how Alex sort of thinks about guitar. The song um, "Fly By Night." He uses an intro that's a little outside what everyone else would do, right? Here's he he starts it off with a D chord. Now a lot of guys would just put the pinky down on the G and do the suspended fourth thing, right? 
Right. That's not what Alex does. Alex plays a D. <laughs> then he grabs the E with his first finger and then plays the A, the D, and the G. So it's a completely different flavor. Listen to the two. This is the way every everybody else would have done it. This is the way Alex didn't do it. Listen to the difference. <laughs> Not the same. This is the way Alex did it. You hear the difference? You hear the difference in there? That low E changes the entire color of the chord. Instead of it being a D with a suspended fourth, it's now an E with a, sp a suspended fourth and a seventh on top. Or, I'm sorry, an A with a suspended fourth and a seventh on top, the G on top. So unique, not what anyone, it's not, it's not a chord anyone else would have used. In fact, I call that the Alex chord. That's the Alex chord. He wound up using this again in a song called Roll the Bones. Um, totally different feel, totally different song. Uh, and we're talking 20 years between the two, maybe 25 years between the two. Uh, but he uses that, he uses that very same chord again. Alex, I was always intrigued by the the chord structures that Alex chose for a lot of the songs instead of just using constant bar chords or you know the the same three finger chords that everybody uses Alex chose different ways to do things Alex loved to use open strings too in very unique and creative ways that you didn't hear a whole lot of other bands doing here's a here's a little lick from this is from Xanadu and again this is another one of those Alex chords <laughs> doing is he's playing an F sharp on the bottom here, right? He's got F sharp, C sharp, F sharp, and A sharp, right? Like he's playing a bar chord, but he's leaving the top two strings open, the B and the E, to add that, that altered chord structure. It's no longer just an F sharp. Now he uses that again throughout the song for the top part. All right. And then he also uses it. Here's something else that um, you might recognize. This is this is another one of those instances where the Alex chord really really makes the song kind of outstanding, right? That's a very basic concept. What he's doing is he's playing E, B, G sharp, uh, and then A. But he's doing it in such a way that it's totally unique. He's he's adding those open strings on the top. Here's the E with the open strings on the top. And here's the B. Now, technically, this isn't a G sharp. It's an E with a G sharp in the bass. But again, he's using those open strings. He's droning those open strings on the top so that you can hear. And then the A. He uses that same concept of, of, of adding the open strings in so many different songs, and we're going to look at them. We're going to sort of do this I'm going to try to do this album by album, but I have to sort of skip around so that I can draw the parallels of, of style in both what Alex is doing and in the drums and in the bass to show you how those, although the band evolved dramatically over the years, um, they maintained, they held on to some very basic concepts that made the music great in the early years and then expanded on those as time went by. That open string concept is, he, Alex uses it so often, I could literally name off 30 songs right now where he does it. He does it in 
Uh, he does it in limelight. Um... He's playing a B with his first four fingers, like a, a bar chord B, but he's got those open strings up top. So, I mean, he uses the open strings. He drones them constantly. He does it in that. Um, he does it in, uh, there's another notable moment, I, and I can't, you know, the name escapes me. We're going to get into it, though. Not on the first album. His playing is very, very stripped down and very focused. He knows who he is at that moment. You know what I mean? He's still finding his way as a soloist. But as a rhythm guitar player, he, he's already figured out who he is a little bit, and he knows what he wants to do. And you can hear that in his playing. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to let this video go too long, but I'm going to make suggestions. The two songs that that I think are the highlights for me are not the radio hits. For me, the radio hits have never been my favorite Rush songs, ever, ever. I like them, don't get me wrong, some of them I love, but the ones that I absolutely adored were the ones that never made the radio. The song, the song Here Again and the song Before and After. Those to me are the two highlights on the album. Working Man, yeah, it's good, I'm, I can't lie to you. It broke them, it made them, you know, a, a household name. Um, in the Mood, What You're Doing, Need Some Love, Take a Friend, all these songs. I mean, they're really, really good songs. The two that stand out for me on that album, though, um, and I, I guess I could add a third one, In the End. In the End is a beautiful, beautiful song. <laughs> Familiar walk down. Alex uses that on a, on a lot of different things. A lot of different things that he does. He does the first time is on 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 that song on the end. In the end, it's called in the end, not the end. In the end, he uses that walk down. Then next album, we hear it again on. <laughs> That a lot, but then again, it was a it's kind of a common practice in the in the in the context of the time that the album was being made and then broke. They were not doing anything truly unique on that first album, not really. They were at the time there were a lot of Zeppelin clone bands out there. There were a lot of bands that wanted to be Led Zeppelin but couldn't. Um, Rush was close, sort of, you know what I mean, but. They, they had already, by the time that that album was made, had already established a sort of feel and sound of their own. Um, with John Rutsey, their original drummer, um, it was very basic, though. He was not what I call, there are two types of drummer, drummers. There are substance drummers and there are flash drummers, okay? I, I break them down into two basic components. There are substance drummers, guys who are always on, always on the downbeat, always on one, always, right? Never make you guess where it is. They're there all the time. That's John Rutsey. He's there. He's on the one every single time you need him to be there. Neil was more of a flash drummer. Neil could do the one, but Neil could do so much more on top of just that. He was a substance drummer, a flash drummer more than a substance drummer, but in the context of the band... He came off as more of a, a substance guy. You know what I mean? It was exactly what the band needed. John Rutsey was exactly what the band needed when their first album was produced. 
That was what they needed. They didn't need anything fancy. They weren't really rushed yet. Not yet. And there are a great many people who will argue about when Rush became Rush. Some will tell you that Rush became Rush when 2112 was released. Other people will tell you that Rush became Rush when Hemispheres was released. My own personal um, philosophy of that is Rush became Rush when Permanent Waves was released. That's when they became, that's when they became the band they would eventually all they would wind up being forever just a powerhouse trio with smart writing uh, smart lyrics um and just musicianship that just no one could touch you got to be honest you may not like the band you might not like the music you might think getty sounds a little bit kind of like a hamster caught in a microwave when he's singing you know and a lot of people will will agree with that but you can't deny these guys were great at what they did how many better bass players can you name how many better drummers can you name you could probably name better guitar players but you have to remember in the context of the band there were two other virtuoso musicians there so alex had to become a virtuoso in a different way alex became a virtuoso playing rhythm guitar instead of playing lead alex learned to use guitar the way a lot of keyboard players use keyboards he used textures and he used um, mood. He used a lot of mood uh, with, with, with some of his, his rhythm playing. Um, uh, a good example of that, I think, a good example of that is the intro and then the first little bit of Red Barchetta. This is a mood. He's establishing a mood. And it's because he's using harmonics, um, touch harmonics, it sort of gives a kind of a keyboard-esque sort of feel. Again, sort of, it's guitar, and it's obvious, but he's sort of adding, he's letting all these notes ring out. And you notice in the intro, he lets all those notes ring out, and they interplay with each other. And then when you stack that bass line up that's going on at the same time, right? He's, Getty's playing this really cool little melody on bass, and Alex has got these sort of keyboard tones going on in the background, little kind of a, a bell sound. That's what these harmonics wind up sounding like to me. It reminds me of a little bit of bells. And then there's that cool bass line that Getty's playing. It's just awesome. You know, we're going to talk about that. I think I can still play it. It's kind of hard. But um, the main, the meat, the rhythm guitar part that, that Alex kicks into after the harmonics, again, is he's using, oh, he's using, you know, ringing chords. And he's sort of, um, he's, 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 He's circling around. I, it's, it circles back to itself. This, this rhythm part circles right back to itself every single time. And that's one of the things that's perfect about this song. back to itself perfectly every single time there's no there are no rough spots in that in that progression and he's just playing he's, it's the a and then the f sharp then the g It's not, it's not a hard lick to play. I'm sort of not sitting properly, so my, my posture is awful, and I'm kind of blowing a few notes here and there. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's not difficult. It's not a difficult line. It doesn't require a lot of excessive, you know, finger reach and all this stuff. 
but it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, progression, start to finish. And, you know, the way, not only the way he's playing it, but the effects that he uses on it as well. Alex was always a big fan of chorus and reverb, always, always. Always had to have chorus on his guitar. Now, it's not something that I particularly care for. I don't like the sound of a, a cycling chorus. I don't like the, that, that chorus cycle sound, that wow. I don't like that. I've never liked it. I use a pitch shifter in shit instead. So what I get is I get a chorus sound, but I get a chorus sound with no cycle to it whatsoever. And you just saw one of my cats walk past this. One of my, yeah. One of those cats is the reason that I couldn't get my audio work to, to work the other day. They jumped on my um, little uh, headphone distribution app and pulled one of the plugs out. So, um, but uh, uh, back to Red Barchetta. That intro is just awesome. His, his effects, his effects choices have been varied, but consistent through the years. On the first few albums, Alec loves him. He loves him some phaser. He uses phaser on almost everything. Um, he uses a little wah here and there, which is cool. Uh, but he uses it tastefully. He doesn't use it on every song. I don't like, I don't like guitar players that, that think that wah is the be all and end all to solo. No, not really. You don't have to have it. It does work in certain cases, but you don't have to have it. It's not a necessity. Um, you can hear wh what I'm doing today. I'm just, I've just got my Les Paul, um, and I've got uh, my V amp over here with, with you know, just a basic Marshall sim on it. I've got a little bit of delay. You can sort of hear that a little short delay and it fades fairly quickly. I've got a little bit of reverb. You can hear the reverb on the mic too, but it's the same reverb on the guitar. But I'm not using much as far, I don't have any chorus, no phaser, no flanger, no nothing. It's just very stripped down and very basic. I didn't want to have effects be part of the discussion until later, until they became, I guess, um, important, vitally important to the overall sound of the band. The first couple albums, the only thing you really heard Alex use was a little chorus here and there, some reverb, and a little wah, and that was about it. So the first album, to get back to the first album, he, he's, he's, he, he knows who he is a little bit, right, as a rhythm guitar player, and he's confident, and he's a great player. I mean, for as young as they were, these were really, truly talented guys, Rutsy included. These were truly talented guys for as young as they were. They were you know, early 20s, late teens, early 20s when this album came out. So these are immensely talented guys from a very early age. Um, uh, the, a lot of the stuff that you'll hear on that first album is just, I mean, yeah, it's basic and it's stripped down. And, and Getty doesn't have as much control over his voice as he will eventually have. But you can hear that raw power. Dude could sing higher than anybody, anybody. Right. Um, that became more and more apparent by the time 2112 hit. Everyone knew knew who Rush was. This first album, though, didn't go. It didn't go over as well nationwide until they started touring on it. When they started touring on it, all of a sudden the album started to sell a little bit more, a little bit better. Uh, they were getting radio play. Uh, the the uh, station in Cleveland is the one that literally played Working Man for the very first time. American audiences heard Working Man in Cleveland for the very first time. So Cleveland loved them. Uh, and then America began to love them as they toured more on that first album. Um, something else about these videos. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm not going to go into in-depth detail about why they got together, how they got together, you know, I'm not going to be able to name the dates for every tour. I may not remember the date of every album, but I know every song, every one of them. Um, I know how to play about, I know how to play more than half of the Rush catalog. And I think that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 240 or 250 songs. They've got 19 studio albums. 19. They've got 19 studio albums. They've got four live albums. And they've got an EP. The EP we're not going to talk about. That's other people's music. So that's not really all that big a deal to me. It was good stuff. It was fun to hear my favorite band playing their favorite music. The stuff that influenced them. But um, I'm not going to go into in debt. There's nothing special about that as far as the music went. Um, they didn't break any new ground. You know what I mean? 
the way Rush operated in the early days, and I, you know, I, I say early days up to the up to the point that they um, eventually disbanded, they would put out four studio albums, then they would put out a live album, then they would put out four studio albums, then they would put out a live album. The first two live albums were, I think, um, two of the best live albums of all time. Of all, I mean, live albums, though. not all albums, but live albums. The first one, All the World's a Stage, was a retrospective on those first four albums, Rush, Fly By Night, Caress Is Steel, and 2112. And they were young and raw and just dying to make a name for themselves. The next live album they did was Exit Stage Left. Yeah, you've heard of that one, right? That's because that's the one that came out immediately following moving pictures. Some people call that the moving pictures tour, but it wasn't. It was just their it was the it was the live album they do after their fourth studio. So it had everything from it had stuff from uh, from uh, hemispheres and permanent waves and uh, uh, farewell to kings and uh, moving pictures. So very different. The first live album into the second live album is almost like two, listening to two different bands. Stylistically, they changed completely in between those two albums, right? In between All the World's a Stage and Exit Stage Left, they were a completely different band. All the World's a Stage was the first live album they did. It was a lot of their early material, a lot of the stuff, like I said, from the first album, from Fly By Night, um, from Caress of Steel, which, you know, a lot of people hated. I thought it was outstanding. I thought it was absolutely beautiful. Um, there was a lot of weird stuff on it. You could tell there was a lot of dope smoking going on. I got nut hate. Not hating on that. Go ahead. Whatever, you know, whatever gets me another Rush album is fine with me. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you're you know, lighting chickens on fire and smoking them. I don't care. As long as I get a Rush album out of it, I'm good. I don't care. Um, that first live album, though, was very raw. Um, the production was a little edgy. You know what I mean? It wasn't polished. The production, the next live album they did, Exit Stage Left, the production was so slick and so perfect, and the band was so good. Stylistically, two different bands from the first live album to the second one. Totally different bands, right? And if you have a chance, I have all of them. I have every Rush album that's ever been put out, all of them, live, EP, everything. I have them all. So um, you can find a lot of this stuff on YouTube. It's better to listen to the actual album itself in its entirety, not necessarily on album, but on CD or whatever, but listen to, the, listen to it in its entirety to sort of give you the big picture of what the band was like at the time that album came out. Their fourth studio album had already been released. They were touring on that fourth studio album and recording their next live album. So you get a lot of that, a lot of the material from, on, on All the World's a Stage, a lot of the material that you're hearing from, from 2112 hadn't even been heard outside of a CD. They hadn't toured on it yet. So that's where that music came from. Same thing with Exit Stage Left. <coughs> on Exit Stage Left, yeah, moving pictures broke them just enormous everywhere. But apart from hearing it on the radio, no one had seen a lot of that material yet, and no one had seen them perform it. And it's one thing to be able to play YYZ in the studio. It's another thing to step off stage, to step up on stage and play that some bitch note for note perfect every single night for eight months. And they did it every single night for eight months. Ain't no getting around that, right? That's badass. Um, they were one of those bands that live, they were better live than they were in the studio and better live in the sense that not only did they play everything note for note, but they also, you know, would occasionally add these little flourishes to show you, oh yeah, we can do better than that. Trust me, we've been thinking about it. We should have done this better. So um, we're, what, uh, we're about 40 minutes into this video, so I'm probably going to draw this to a close pretty quick. But uh, I just wanted to say that um, I, I, I love this band. I mean, for a lot of different reasons. As a fan, I love them as a fan. I'm going to talk about their music from the standpoint of, of how, not just how to play it. I'm not going to teach anybody songs. 
I just want to show you some of the things that made them so so unique and 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 just so awesome and some and really the only way to do that is to show you how they did it right to show you how they did it <laughs> It's easier, I think, when you're talking about doing a, an in-depth, sort of a critical analysis of the band itself. I wanted to see it done from a musician's standpoint, right? I'd seen a couple of guys reviewing Rush albums individually. I saw one guy reviewing Rush albums worst to first and all this stuff, and I thought, you know, that's nice, but you're not really, you don't seem to really truly understand how, di how difficult it was to, to step off with those kinds of albums in the, in the middle period, that weird middle synth period, you don't know how difficult, well, it, difficult it, it was to step off and do that kind of stuff and still try to maintain integrity as a band and maintain a loyal fan following, which was difficult. Those of us in the know, those of us who are true aficionados, true mavens, those of us who are true fans appreciated, understood and appreciated the evolution the band went through because we saw them evolve from doing... <laughs> You know, to doing different than they evolved and real fans true fans and and the musicians who loved them understood the evolution they understood the need for them to experiment and try new things we can't just be this one thing we can't be 2112 forever we can't just be permanent waves or moving pictures forever you either evolve or you die. The dinosaurs will tell you that. Um, and they weren't going to be dinosaurs. They were not going to be extinct. They were constantly pushing themselves to find new areas, new styles, new approaches, um, new instruments. You know, uh, Alex uses a little bit of acoustic guitar in the early years, not a lot. A little bit of classical guitar in the early years, not a lot, but begins to supplement the music as the years go by. Um, with more acoustic, more classical stuff. Getty sort of toys around with synthesizer noises at first. You know what I mean? The first, uh, the first uh, album that he actually used any sort, of, any sort of real true synth stuff was 2112. But began to really fall in love with the textural things that you could do with it. You know, you could really add, you could, you could make the music um, have a, a, a better more uh, encompassing feel because, you know, synths and keyboards could add mood along with the bass and the guitar and the drums, right? It was just, they were not taking anything away from who they were. They were incorporating more to, be, to, to become what they wanted to be. They wanted to experiment. That's, this, that's the defining, I think, the defining aspect of the band was they were never happy with the last album. They were never going to put out Permanent Waves 2. They were never going to put out Fly By Night 2. You know what I mean? It was never going to happen. They were always going to expand and always going to add more than they did last time. They made a huge leap. People talk a lot, a lot about the difference between 2112 and Moving Pictures. And those are the two, everyone will pretty much agree, those are the two seminal moments in the band's history. 2112 gave them a name. Moving Pictures put them in the Hall of Fame. There's just no other way to look at it. 
Um, the differences, though, between Fly By Night and Caress of Steel, exactly the same. But Fly By Night was a, a good album, a great album. And, it was, and they were beginning to add these really cool things. There's a, a song on there called The Necromancer and, and the intro. I've always just loved the intro because of this cool chord pattern that, that Alex is playing. <laughs> down again Alex is really he uses it he uses it often but it always seems to be unique to the song that he's using it in right this <laughs> sounds sounds completely different from <laughs> so yeah it's the same basic structure same basic pattern but he makes it unique to the song he's putting it in. So um, the differences between Fly By Night, back to that, the differences between Fly By Night and Caress of Steel, huge, huge. Almost as big as the difference between the first album and Fly By Night. That was pretty big. That was pretty big. Fly By Night was not what the record company expected. Not. They wanted to hear Working Man 2. They wanted to hear the sequel to the first album. And Rush didn't want to do that. Rush is always going to go further, always going to go and do what they want to do, musically, stylistically, and not necessarily always for the fans at first, because they didn't have a huge following at first to be able to do the things they wanted to do. They had to gain it as time went by, and there were, they were, at one point, one of the hardest working bands in, in, of all time. These guys toured constantly, constantly, and always in support of an album that the critics hated. The fans loved, but the critics hated. Critics hated Rush. We're going to talk about that, too. We're going to talk about Rolling Stone's um, snub, their 30-year snub of Rush. Oh, I'm still mad about that. Still. Um, yeah, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna wrap this up real quick um, and, and talk just a little bit more about the first album. The two highlights that I think the two highlights for me that you might also enjoy, again, are here again and before and after. Don't always listen. Don't always just accept what the radio plays a rush. Those guys are idiots. They don't know what's good. Trust me. If radio guys knew what was good, Millie Vanilli would never have been a thing. Okay? Don't trust the radio guys. They don't know shit. Nothing. Um, you need to look deeper. Because the really the best rush is the stuff you never hear on radio, never. Some of I, I, I said it before. Some of my ap, most of my absolute favorite songs have been songs that have never been on the radio. You know, you'll never hear them on the radio. A, they're too long. B, they're too proggy. They're too prog rock, and radio doesn't. You know, AOR radio doesn't really care for prog rock all that much. Um, they're too intellectual, or Getty's voice sounds stupid. You know that kind of stuff. That's, you know, we're going to go through that album by album. I'm going to give you my favorites from each album um, from, a, from a musician's point of view and a fan's point of view. It's hard for me to separate those two, right? As a musician, I appreciate what they could do from a technical standpoint. You know what I mean? Some of the finest musicians that I've ever seen play, ever. Um, from a fan's point of view, it's hard for me to not see that music from a, pan, a fan's point of view. I've learned a lot of those songs, about half the catalog. I know about half of it. I'll have to bone up on some of it for these videos to make sure I don't play it too terribly, like I just did YYZ a minute ago. That was pretty bad. But then again, that's not the easiest song on the planet to play, believe me. Um, uh, it, it's tough for me to separate how much I love them as a fan and then how much I love them as a musician. As a musician, there's just to me, there's no band that, that will ever have the same kind of technical chops and expertise that those guys did, ever. So in the next video, we, we talked a little bit about the first two albums. We talked a little bit about Fly By Night. We're going to talk a little bit more about Fly By Night. Um, great album. We talked a, a little bit about the first album in Fly By Night. I'll probably talk a little bit more about Fly By Night 
um, on, on the next um, uh, video that I do, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Fly By Night, but we're going to talk about um, Caress of Steel, which, wow, talk about an album that nobody liked. God, even the band didn't like it after it came out. Um, I liked it. I thought I think there are some truly beautiful moments on there, and we're going to talk about those. We're going to talk about how Fly By Night became Caress of Steel, how they went from one to the other, so radically, drastically different in style and approach. Um, the first of the themed albums, the first. Um, on Fly By Night, they had, uh, uh, I think, was it The Necromancer? It was the, Necrom the Necromancer, great song, By Torn the Snow Dog, great song. Love that song. Um, Caress of Steel, wow, was there some weird stuff on that. Bastille Day, Lakeside Park, I think I'm going bald. Um, the whole uh, 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 panacea uh, thing, gee, wow, that was weird. That was weird stuff. So next video, next video, going to be very cool. We're going to talk about the next two albums. We're going to talk about Caress of Steel. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about Fly By Night, but Caress of Steel and 2112. And yeah, yeah, 2112, you bet. Awesome going to be great then we actually probably will look at at some point in in one of these videos i may settle down and just talk about the live albums by themselves to show you how different like i said the the difference between the first and the second live albums is just night and day two different bands but i would like to sit down and talk about how how they presented the music of the time so well in a live format they did it really really well um so next, uh, next video, kids, is going to be all about um, Caress of Steel. We may not spend that much time on Caress of Steel. Honestly, there's a lot about it I like, but then there's a lot of junk on there. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't even get, and I was a Rush fan. So, but 2112. We're going to talk about 2112, and we're not going to just talk about Temples of the Syrinx and, you know, and all that stuff. We're going to talk about the whole album, the whole album, right? Something for Nothing, and all these other really, really great songs. Uh, so next time, next time, Little Fly By Night, Little Caress of Steel, 2112. All right? So kids, remember, stay in school, don't do drugs, love Rush. <laughs>